everybody, my name is Fred Nueska, and I'm a volunteer here at the Stagecoach Museum in Newberry Park. And right where I stand right here, at one time, a huge coastal live oak tree grew. And we have slabs from that uh, tree when it was cut down. And you can see the slabs over here. You can see how large the tree was, about six feet by about four and a half feet wide. So this oak tree was quite high, possibly 60 feet high. You can see how wide the base trunk was. This particular trunk here went up to about six feet, and then there were three more trunks that branched off from that base trunk. So we wanted to have some slabs so that we could uh, read the uh, age range, the growth range, to see about how old this uh, tree was. And so when we got these slabs, as you can see, then fortunately they were rotted out inside and uh, they were hollow. So we couldn't really get a good slab to uh, count the uh, growth rate to see how old the tree was. So I uh, called up the National Park Service and talked to Mark Mendelson, who is the field botanist, uh, to see uh, if he could advise us as to what to do to get this, uh, the, the uh, growth rates on this oak tree uh, examined and, uh, and read to determine how old this oak tree might be. He referred me to Dr. Robert Taylor, who is also a botanist with the National Park Service, whose uh, specialty is dendrology. And uh, that is the counting, the study of the counting of, of uh, different uh, trees and their uh, growth rates. However, in order to get a good reading, Dr. Taylor told me that uh, because the coast live oak tree uh, grows very slowly and the wood is uh, very dense and uh, that makes the growth rings uh, grow very close to each other, compressed so to speak, that uh, it's very, they're, they're one of the hardest trees of all to uh, read, uh, to examine. Uh, so he said, uh, he gave me explicit instructions um, as to how to prepare the slab so he could come out and examine it. And uh, so this is the slab that we decided to keep. It, uh, it came from further up, of course, and, uh, but it's solid, it's not, it's not rotted out on the inside. And according to his instructions, the very first thing you want to do, it's a four-step uh, process, is to sand it down with the bell sanding with very heavy grit, uh, 60 grit, in, uh, in this case, uh, sandpaper. Then you do that, and you follow it up with an orbital sander, or a jitterbug, as it's commonly called, uh, with very fine sandpaper, with finer sandpaper. And after that, I will go over it with very fine, maybe a thousand uh, sandpaper um, uh, by hand to see if I can get any of the low spots that the orbital sander missed, or any other spots that were difficult to get to. <clears throat> and then after that, the fourth step is I'll take some very fine four-aught steel wool and go over the slab. This will not take any wood off, but it'll give it kind of a kind of a, a shine a bit more, actually. <laughs> and you can see I've already taped the bark because we don't want to lose any of the bark if possible when I'm sanding. So, that being said, I, I will start working on this slab and it'll take quite a few hours before it's good enough to read. Well, I finished working on the, the oak tree slab and we're very fortunate today to have Dr. Robert Taylor here with us. Who is, he is a botanist and an, an ecologist and uh, also a dendrologist, and he has kindly offered to read our slab and, and to see what he might find. So uh, with that being said, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Robert Taylor. Hello, I'm Robert Taylor. I'm a fire GIS specialist for the Santa Monica Mountains National Recreation Area, the National Park Service. Uh, he's, uh, we manage the open space in these beautiful mountains right here and uh, all around us here. And I'm here to, to, to 
show you about counting tree rings and tell you how to how to count tree rings, how we do it, and uh, what tree rings can tell us about the history of the tree and history of things like fire in this area. Um, this is a uh, slab of the tree. Our heritage oak tree here had, if you saw when it was alive, it had three major trunks coming up. It was what we call a multiple stemmed oak tree. It didn't have a single trunk, it had three. And at the base is this very confusing mess of fire scars and hollowness and various regrowing that we were looking at before. Um, but this is about as low on the tree as you could cut and get a nice continuous solid cut through through a single stem that's solid all the way to the center. So we're working with this. This piece was cut somewhere between like waist high and shoulder high, I guess. And Fred and Weska did a really good job of sanding up the surface uh, really well so that the rings are as visible as they can be. Now, Coast Life Oaks are kind of notorious among people who count tree rings because the rings are not super visually distinct. They're kind of hard to see. It's a kind of wood that we refer to as uh, ring diffuse wood and the early season wood and the late season wood don't look that different. So you have to use some tricks to look at it. And one good trick is that if you get it wet, it brings the grain out, makes it easier to see. So I've been doing that a lot and it keeps drying up, but I'm gonna just add a little water here. I also know it's really hard to show people on a video call what the tree rings look like. So you're not gonna get a super good close look at this here. Now, when you count tree rings, you always start from the outside and work towards the center because we know the age of this ring right here. This tree was cut down in uh, February of this year, 2021. And so the last year, the last growth ring here represents the 2020 growing season. So I labeled the very first ring here, 2020. Now you can think of tree rings as kind of like an annual progress report for a tree. Every tree has got a structure called the vascular cambium, which is right under the bark. If you peel off a piece of bark and it's kind of green underneath, that's the cambium. And it annually grows wood to the inside and it grows bark to the outside. So every year it, the out, outer bark gets a little bit thicker and it lays down one more ring here. And because we have seasons and the trees grow kind of different wood early season and late season you get sort of a break when one season ends and the next one begins and you can see a ring and on ring diffuse wood like this it's kind of hard to see but if you sand it up very carefully and you wet the surface and you especially if you use reading glasses magnifying glasses help you see it and the most convenient place to put the magnifying glasses is on your face so I went and bought the highest powered reading glasses I could find and use this to count so this whole tree from outside to the center is it's about 12 inches and uh, just give you the bottom line here in case you're in a hurry um this uh this is 96 years worth of tree growth here the stem 96 years old and the, it was about waist high so from give it a couple years to get that high up from the ground and this this piece of wood was about 100 years old probably took about 100 years for the stem to grow this was a uh, multiple stem tree so it uh um itself is represents re-sprouts from an earlier fire event 100 years ago there may have been a fire that top killed this tree and caused it to re-sprout. That's something we see very commonly in these kind of trees in this part of the world. And uh, it would take more research to be quite sure of that, but that's probably what happened here. Um, so when you start counting tree rings, it's kind of standard practice when you do this, we'll get the wood wet is you start from the outside and every 10 years you put a mark on the wood, put one dot. And then you check your work a lot because tree rings are it's easy to miscount. Sometimes you get locally absent rings. Sometimes in a weird growth year, a tree can lay down something that looks like a double ring. And so you want to look carefully at that. And if you get hung up in a certain place while you're counting here, you can sort of follow the ring around to another part of the wood where the ring may be a little more clear and refer to that. And so I did all those things and did a good, slow, careful job counting these. And uh, I'll just sort of talk you through it here. Get a little water on here. Piece of wood, of course, so it's constantly soaking up the water. But when you've got a sheen of water on the surface, the rings are actually pretty, pretty clear up close. So another thing about trees is that when they're young, they grow rather fast. And as they get older and older, the rings kind of get a little bit narrower. They're laying down wood around a larger circle, so they're still making a large volume of wood. But what I've marked here is decades. Every 10 years, I put a dot. So I counted in 10 years. So there's 2020, there's 2010. So 10 years, it grew that much. Now back in here in, in its youth, it was growing that much in 10 years. Um, these are in the 1960s here, but um, that, that's, that's something we see in trees very commonly. So anyway, we'll count in. There's 10 years to this dot. Another 10 years got me here. Another 10 gets me here. This is 1990, so we're 30 years back here. 40 years back here. And when you're counting tree rings, every 50 years you put two dots. That's kind of tree ring counting convention, so I did that here. That gets us back 50 years to 1970. 
Remember, we started from 2020, so everything's reckoned from that year. Coming on back. This is, this discoloration on the wood here is, makes my job kind of difficult here. This probably formed when the tree was dying. This tree has some heart rot here, and uh, these stains here are from a different kind of process than the tree rings. Those are not tree rings, and they kind of obscure the view of the tree rings a little bit, so I had to be very careful crossing these boundaries, and I kind of went back and forth in different places to pick up the rings and be sure I was getting a good count. Um, anyway, so I get into 1950 here, so we're back. There's my 50s, so let's see, there's 50s, so there's 60, there's 70 years back. Back to 1940, back to 1930, and then there was another, I guess just a couple of years, gets me back six years. But the pith of this thing here was 1924, 96 years old. And that probably accurate to the plus or minus a year or two. This tree had three trunks that all came together at the base. I think we're looking at one, two, three here. These are, this is a slice, remember? So as we came up through the tree, these three pieces would diverge into separate trunks. Now, when a tree gets damaged by fire or sometimes by other things like browsed by deer or if it's a little tree or cut down if it's a big tree, uh, they will re-sprout. They'll produce a lot of vigorous new little sprouts coming up from the, from the root crown. And uh, what will happen over time is they'll compete with each other and the strongest ones will grow taller and start shading out the less strong ones and pretty soon the little ones die off and you're left with just a couple. This was a multiple stem tree. This was three trunks coming out and it probably dates to an even earlier fire event, something that happened a uh, hundred or more years ago perhaps. So each one of these trunks would have started out as a little shoot. We could see the center of it. You can actually count rings back to and you can find a little pith in the very center of the trunk from when it was a little, little bitty shoot. So it started out as little shoots and then they grew bigger and bigger and they started pushing up against each other. And when they start pushing up against each other, you get embedded bark. The bark of this one touches the bark of that one and they start pushing against each other with a lot of force over the course of a number of years, you know, growing trees, a lot of weight they can push really hard and so you'll get a sort of a seam of embedded bark as this one's growing this way this one's growing this way and they so this is an embedded strip of, strip of bark between the two trunks that comes in maybe about here maybe it goes all the way into there and in the middle where the wood is under pressure it's being compressed the rings get really weird and right here the rings are really weird if you do a little bit of close-up here you can see we don't have nice even concentric bands here we've got very wavy weird wood here this is kind of a Woodworkers might call this a burl. Uh, if you were a woodworker, you might be able to harvest a piece of wood like this out of a tree and, you know, put it on a lathe and make it into a beautiful salad bowl or something. But if you're trying to count tree rings and figure out when something happened, this is the kind of area you want to avoid. We can't make any sense of this. But we can, I can show you generally that there were, there was a stem here and a stem there. Okay. Embedded bark, compression wood. We've got more compression, we've got more embedded bark here. There's another, another piece. Uh, this is old bark on the inside here. This is rotten wood. Here are roots. Uh, as this tree rots out from the center, it starts accumulating all kinds of humus and stuff inside, and it'll sometimes start growing roots into itself, if you will, you know, in, into its own hollow to take advantage of some of the biological activity that's going on in here. There'll be good nutrient cycling going on in here. So these are, I guess you could call them adventitious roots. Um, and over here, Here's more embedded bark. This is, this is actually a charcoal surface here. This is very old charcoal right here. This, this section here was burned in some older fire and uh, charcoal doesn't rot very much. It'll be still sitting there many, many years after the fire that caused it sometimes. Um, so that's a little more evidence that we had a fire back then. Now you can see how thick the bark is on the outside of this tree. This was a good mature coast live oak tree that probably something in the order of more than 100 years old and uh, the bark is very fire resistant and it's very resistant to heat and a tree that was growing out in a natural area where wildfires can reach it uh, would be protected from wildfire in a lot of situations by this good thick bark and the older trees have thicker bark than the younger trees so sometimes the older trees are more fire resistant when a tree gets really old and it gets scarred 
opens up the base, that's kind of a point of vulnerability for future fires. Future fires can get in there and burn it more and more. So that's a way in which an old tree can actually become more vulnerable over time. It'll, uh, if it can't grow fast enough to heal itself over, uh, and fire frequency comes more often than it can, in the time it takes to close the gap, uh, fire scars will sometimes kind of get scarred again and again and again and get bigger and bigger. Sometimes you can find evidence of several fires in one hollow tree. This tree's history is sufficiently difficult to read. I don't think I'm going to reach any conclusions about fires older than that 30-year one there. Um, you know, a tree that sees a lot of fire can be top-killed. All the branches above ground can die, but there's a tremendous ability for an oak tree to re-sprout after a situation like that. It gets a good growing year after a fire, and lots of little buds will form in some of the less burned branches, and if it gets burned really hard, they'll come up from the roots, in which you then you get a whole lot of little shoots coming up. If you've ever seen this, this will happen when a tree gets cut down, too. If someone were to cut a coast live oak down with a chainsaw and leave the stump, the next year you'd probably come out and find a whole bunch of little shoots coming up from the roots as it's trying to regrow itself. And those will grow, and little shoots will shade out the the shoots are kind of competing with each other for sunlight, and usually a couple of them do better than the others and grow, and the other ones die off, and you end up with just a couple of stems going up. This, this tree, as I mentioned, had three big stems. So 96 years ago, 1924, there may have been a fire event here that top-killed this tree, and these were re well, actually, probably a couple of years more than that. So 1924, it was that, that tall. It might have taken two or three years to get there. So maybe 2021, something like that, we might have had a fire through here that top-killed the older tree, and the old tree that we saw here, this hundred year old tree could actually be re-sprouts from an even older tree than that that might be another hundred or two hundred years old. Um, and we don't really have any direct evidence of how old that original tree is because the center has rotted out. This is a hundred year old regrowth, you know, major re major branch coming off of a re-sprouting stump from an even older tree. And that origin of that tree is kind of lost in the sands of time basically, but it if you imagine it was another 100 years, which is not unreasonable, this thing could very well have been a 200-year-old tree. Could have been even older than that. Um, we can only count back as far as we've got solid wood. Uh, the tree rings can only tell us the story so much. You get to the center of a tree where it's rotten out, and that, it's, it's as if the, the history has been lost. Um, so anyway, the bottom line is this, this thing was 96 years old. The, the, the whole tree's probably a couple years older than that, so something in the order of 100 years old. And... Uh, the tree dates from a from an even earlier event. Um, 100 years ago, something top killed this tree, and that's that's what I'm able to tell you from this slab. There's other stories we can tell from the uh, other pieces, fire scars. We we'll look at those in another part of our talk here. It was laying down rings and growing out like this. Um, it was about this big when it got hit by fire, I presume, uh, and it killed the cambium on this side. So there's one corner of a scar, and there's another corner of a scar. Now, when a tree gets scarred by fire, the very first growing season after the fire, it does a cool thing. It grows wood that has different properties than regular wood. It's under a microscope. It kind of looks like almost a mixture of wood and cork cells together. It can be often kind of reddish in color, and it's very resistant to rot, and it'll lay down a growth ring that strongly resists rot from the center. So when this tree got scarred here, it got scarred from there to there, and it laid down a highly resistant rot ring, and then over the course of the years after that, the center started rotting. It was open on this side, and the rot kind of started in the center and came out, but it got hung up at that, that layer that, that year after the fire. It pretty much stops, you know, the rot pretty much stops right here. And it'll eventually cross that, but it might take several decades. The tree is like, made a, made a, made a little wall here to protect itself from the rot and slow the rot down. And then the trees out here grow in new wood as fast as it can, and it, it sort of slows down the rot here, you know. In a adventure movie, when the good guys are running away from the bad guys that are running down, you might throw stuff down behind you to kind of slow down the bad guy's pursuit. That's kind of what they're, I think of what they're doing here. They lay down a ring here that slows down the pursuit of the fungus here. And you can see it. That's another thing that kind of tells us that this is where the fire scar started, because there's, there's the, the ring now. This other stuff wasn't here then. This, So it started growing from, from this edge, so Basically, a fire scar is a place where, on the edge of the, where the cambium has been damaged, the tree grows a wider ring than it does in other places, so this wood's growing faster. And it starts to curve in. This is an example of one where this tree successfully compartmentalized its damage. These two lobes, this one coming this way, 
This one coming this way, met. Here's a little fissure of embedded bark. And then, at some point they fused. Stop making bark on the space in between and just start making it out here. And so here's continuous bark out here. So this tree successfully compartmentalized this wound. It sealed up. At a certain stage in this tree's life, the scar wouldn't, you couldn't have seen the scar anymore. Maybe there'd be a little bit of a cleft, but this, this tree actually covered this one over, protected itself, and it, it arrested the progress of the rot here for, for a long time. In a very long course of time, it would have crossed that and continued. And it laid down a whole bunch of new wood out here. So this, that's an example of a, that's a really good example there of a tree healing itself, a fire scar that uh, was successfully compartmentalized and uh, the gap was closed and had a new layer of continuous bark here to be a rot resistant layer. And then, so that's how they do it. Um, that was one stem here. And meanwhile, there were other stems over here doing things. This, this, let's see what we got here. That's probably another rot resistant layer there. So it's, I'm guessing the scar's right here, maybe right there. So this would have been, been the lobe <laughs> on this side coming this way. And so then we got embedded bark as these things met. <laughs> okay. You know, these two fire scars kind of growing back to back towards each other. Uh, Looks like in this tree's life, they didn't quite have enough time to merge that part. Given enough long-term time, maybe they could have done that. Um, okay, so one side of fire scar, is there another fire scar here? We got one here, too. This looks like that rot-resistant layer here. This was probably another a center here. So this could have been layers coming out here. There's embedded bark. So we had another piece of stem here with another piece of fire damage that it was working on healing over here. This tree got old. It's it's a pretty complicated thing. You can see there's several different scars all healing simultaneously. Uh, <laughs> meanwhile, it was trying to grow over this one out here, too. Um, trees don't do a lot of big strategic planning. You know, they're, they're very uh -huh. tactical. They're working on a local scale. These cells right here are growing, and these cells don't really know what those cells are doing. But when they bump up against them, it's like, oh, you know, and then they have a growth response that's adaptive to that. You know, trees aren't conscious, they don't have any kind of a nervous system, they certainly can't make plans for the future, but they have growth patterns that are adaptive and do help them heal from these kind of things, and uh, these are the kind of patterns that you can see in the wood. If you know how trees grow, you can look at something like this and figure out what happened here. If we were to sand this all up and count back here to this year, we could tell what year this fire happened. And it might be, this is probably that same fire, this is probably 1970, that's probably about 30 years of wood there. We'd have to do some more sanding here and some careful counting, but uh, um, I think we may be seeing damage from that same 1970 fire event here. So let's talk about other parts of this tree. So when this tree, in 1970, this was the outer edge of the tree here. Here's the bark. And a fire damaged the cambium on this part over here. This thing started growing this big lobe to try to compartmentalize that damage to start to cover itself up. I counted in. There's 10, there's 20, there's 30. Follow that one around to right there. So I think it's pretty likely this fire scar actually, this, this lobe here actually represents a scar off of the uh, 1970 fire. This could be recovering from damage caused here. This, this damage here could be from the fire in 1970 when the stagecoach in burned down. We have to try counting over here. Let's see if we get the same kind of story. Okay, well that's good. So that validates what I th thought I was going to see from previously. Red flag. I'm seeing what I think I want to see. Um, so the tree was damaged all the same year. So if we count the rings over here, we ought to get the same count. Let's see if we can find where the embedded bark is over here. Um, So let's see, we, um, one thing you'll, you'll sometimes find when you look in old hollow trees and at fire scars is you'll find black charcoal on the inside. Turns out charcoal is very resistant to rot. And so you can find charcoal inside an old tree that's still there from a fire that was tens or hundreds of years ago. So we've got some stuff here. Now we also have rot, and, and rot can sometimes look dark, but charcoal has a pretty distinctive look and we've got some charcoal in here. It's one of the ways we know this is a scar from fire and not from some other kind of damage. So this tree was apparently already hollow and open in 1970. 
when this fire hit here. Now, trees lay down rings that are concentric circles around the center, but they also have these features called rays, and, and they're, they're radial, basically. And you can see those here. These, on a tree like this, they're sometimes more conspicuous than the rings themselves. You see these lines, and they're strands of what they call parenchyma tissue. This was, these were strands of living tissue that were going through the dead cells of the wood to provide some food and nourishment to some of the other living cells in here. Most of the wood of a tree is composed of dead cells. It's called xylem, and when xylem cells grow, they grow and form a big thick cell wall, and then the cell actually dies and just leaves the, leaves the wall. And, and in oak trees, they form a couple different kinds of, we call them woody water pipes. Uh, can you think of them that? There's um, vessel elements, and there are tracheids. Those are two different kinds of cells that are real distinctive on a low-powered microscope. Vessel elements are these big, tube cells. They look a lot like sections of pipe like you might see for a storm drain or something like that. And one end is a little flared, and the other end is a little beveled, and they fit together, and they form these long, continuous uh, vessel elements. Think of them, woody, woody water pipes. I'm not going to speak Latin. Um, but then there are other cells going through that are still alive, and these, these bands of parenchyma are still alive, these rays. Um, so that, they all kind of point back towards the center. So there was a center of this trunk here. It's, it's rotting out. And it's been laying down additional wood out here. Oak trees can live with rot for a long time. As long as they can grow new wood faster than the old wood rots away, they can live for hundreds of years, slowly rotting out from the inside and laying down new wood from the outside. Uh, there's this old uh, English expression they talk about oak trees. They'll say an oak tree lives for 200 years and then it it grows for 200 years, and then it lives for 200 years, and then it dies for 200 years. And they have a different climate there. Trees live different amounts of time, but the basic idea is the same. They have this young growth phase, and then they'll hit sort of a mature phase, and then they'll slowly, slowly die over the course sometimes of hundreds of years. You know, they'll experience a fire or some other kind of damage that opens the trunk up and allows wood rotting fungus to get inside. Uh, there's an amazing ecosystem of animals and funguses that can live inside of rotting wood in a tree. Uh, there's funguses that rot, there are beetles that eat the fungus, there are ants that tend fungus, there are insect eating birds like woodpeckers that come after the uh, insects. Uh, once the trees start getting hollow, woodpeckers start making cavities. Uh, they'll chip away wood and make these cavity nests to use for raising their own babies. And then when they're done, lots of other animals come in and live in those things. Uh, and an oak tree in the last Sort of declining years of its life uh, when it's getting hollow and starting to fall apart um, can actually be some of its biggest contributions in terms of ecosystem functions creating habitat value for for the kind of plant communities and animal communities that live in oak woodlands so when trees get really old and they die I, <laughs> everything dies eventually a, a very old tree will will eventually die and uh, sometimes really old trees uh, fall down they get knocked down by a wind event or uh, Sometimes in a really wet year, when the ground is completely saturated, an old tree will just sort of tip over. <laughs> You'll see that sometimes. Uh, big old valley oaks and coastal live oaks just kind of fall over sideways. Uh, because um, their roots are mostly, they're, they're growing, and their, their roots are under tension. Think, think of a root kind of like a guy wire. You know, it grows out and gets a good fast hold. and Not, not so much propping it up by leaning on it as, as propping itself up by pulling against it. And when the ground's completely wet and soggy in a really wet year, maybe an El Nino year, sometimes the roots will just sort of pull out of the ground oh. and the uh, tree will fall over. Sometimes a tree will actually survive that event. You will sometimes find really old oak trees that are lying on their sides with half of their roots sticking up in the air, but a couple of the roots are in the ground. When it fell over, they didn't all snap, so it can continue to live. Okay. Uh, I have a favorite old tree in um, Arroyo Verde Park in Ventura, which you can go visit if you're interested in such things. With that, has done that. It's kind of lying on its side. It's a really good tree for little kids to climb now because all the big branches are close to the ground and you can let kids climb it without <laughs> letting them get too far off the ground. And, um, but sometimes the tree falls over and, and all its major, its major roots snap, that'll, that'll be it and it'll, it'll be done. And that would be the end of a storied career of a oak tree that may have gone hundreds of years. Um, and of course they're constantly making acorns and uh, acorns often get established in the vicinity of the parent tree, sometimes they take advantage of the moist microclimate afforded by the shade of the older tree. Um, so uh, 
those are the sources of replacement for an old tree that goes down. Um, a little tree's life is very precarious. Very few little trees that start out as a seedling actually make it to maturity. Very few. And what often has to happen for a little tree is it needs to be in the right place at the right time. It needs to have a lucky break. Um, in a forest, uh, trees are all growing kind of shoulder to shoulder, taking up most of the available light, and a little tree getting started on the forest floor is in a pretty shady place. And the only time it's going gonna, it's gonna to get a chance, um, it may be able to hang on there for years in this state, but it's not going to be able to grow very much. And then if one year a wind event comes through and knocks down a big tree, creates what they call a light gap. A big tree will go down, suddenly there's a hole in the canopy and light is reaching the forest floor. And all the little trees in that area just got their call, you know. Today's your day, seize the day. And they all try to grow as fast as they can and one of them's gonna, or maybe two of them will be lucky enough to grow faster than the others and reach that light gap before they can get shaded out by adjacent trees and replace that tree in the canopy. And that's a, you know, can be a real once in a lifetime kind of event. A vast majority of little oak seedlings uh, don't make it. On behalf of the Stagecoach and Museum, I would like to thank Dr. Robert Taylor for his time and expertise. We would also like to express our appreciation to all who have dedicated many hours to this project, and we are grateful for what it has taught us about growth and renewal. Though we are saddened by the departure of our beloved oak, we have found many creative ways to ensure that it is not forgotten, and the oak's legacy is to continue growth at the museum as the inspiration for a major fundraising campaign for property improvements. Support the Stagecoach Inn Museum in its mission to preserve Conejo Valley history by contributing to the Heritage Oak fundraising campaign. Enjoy an afternoon in the oak grove sitting on chairs made from the ancient tree's branches and drop a donation in the box, which will be double matched by Conejo Recreation and Park District through June 30th, 2022 and matched thereafter. Or visit our website at stagecoachinmuseum.com and select the $1 equals $3 button on the support page or Heritage Oak page. Or visit our emporium and buy treasures made from the ancient oak's branches, including candle holders, wine racks, picture frames, plaques, ornaments, plant holders, and so much more. Many of these beautiful items, handmade by longtime volunteer Gary Peterson, also incorporate items from our blacksmith shop, like our single and double horseshoe heart frames mounted on oak. Come by the museum soon and find your very own oak treasures to commemorate this magnificent tree. All proceeds go to supporting the museum.